Yeah. My favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. And it is the extravaganza of the Wednesday edition of Judd's Hockey Show. That means it's Judd, it's Declan, and Jesse Pierce. Wait for it. Bar Down Beauties and also, of course, covers the Wild for NHL.com. And, yes, she is wearing an absolutely lovely Hartford Whalers hoodie. Jesse, bring in the heat every single day. That's awesome. A uh, lot to get to, including good and bad news involving the uh, the Wild. But before we do, I want to give a, a quick shout-out to our partner, Nicolay Law. Nicolay Law knows that when you or a loved one gets injured, ordinary life can come to a sudden stop, and things can get complicated. During that time, insurance companies are likely to pressure you. They don't care if you get better. They don't care if your bills are piling up. They don't care that you may not be able to work. Nicolay Law, however, they do care. They have seen every play the insurance companies have, and they'll drop their gloves to make sure you get the compensation you deserve after an accident. So if you've been injured, get Minnesota's local award-winning injury lawyers. Get Nicolay. Start your path to winning at NicolayLaw.com or give them a call, 1-855-NICOLAY. That's NicolayLaw.com, N-I-C-O-L-E-T, Nicolay Law. We appreciate their support. All right, let's start with last night against the Ducks. The, the Wild now, going into tonight's game against the Kings guys, is within three points of the Vegas Golden Knights for the final playoff spot. But, uh, Jesse, do we have any update on the status of defenseman Jonas Brodeen, who left l- last night's game? It looked like his right leg got folded up. Um, it did not look good. He did not return because I would say in an, injury, in an injury-riddled season for this team, the loss of Brodeen would be a massive loss to this team. The loss again to Brodeen. Minnesota can't cut a break. I mean, injuries have been... Uh, <clears throat> just insurmountable this season. You still have Jules Erickson Eck out. He did not travel to the, with the team, excuse me, to California or meet them in California. Rather, he is possible to return. Uh, per Michael Russo of the Athletic, I did see that they don't think it's like an MCL tear or an ACL tear, which is good, right? That is good. That is not season ending. He was going to get an MRI today. Obviously, he is not going to play this evening against the LA Kings. Uh, but even listening to John Hines post game last night. It sounds like they are optimistic that they're not. It doesn't sound even as dire. Jules Eric's neck, Heinz talking afterward, it seemed a little down and out. Whereas with Broads, Heinz seemed a little bit more positive and and felt a little bit more okay. He was able to get off the ice on his own, uh, obviously putting no pressure on that right leg, as you'd mentioned, Judd. But hopefully it's a short-term thing um, because certainly, as you said, the Wild need him back there on the blue line. And that, yeah, it just looked bad and... um... Well, and you fluky, saw, too. It wasn't, yeah. you know, it was just kind of a, I, I don't love Alex Kilhorn making that play. I haven't loved a lot of his season this year, yeah. um, just in seeing him with the Ducks even as of late. But, yeah, I just, it it didn't seem, it just the way he turned and bent with it a little bit was yeah. the, the odd play. And the problem is there's not really, there, or there is not a good choice to take Brodine's spot, uh, like is Goligoski or Mermis, who, you know, Okay, but they can't take his spot, and obviously his ice time and that of Brock Fabers is absolutely off the charts. Um, I do want to talk about some good things, though, okay? Let's start with Marat Hustadinov, who Eureka can win a (laughs) face-off. And so here's something I didn't get previously. It changed last night, and I liked it. So in the Blues game on Saturday that the Wild uh, trailed 2 nothing. Early in the third period, came back to tie and lost in a shootout. Um, Marat's ice time, he didn't even reach 10 minutes in that game because they they were playing the first line and the second line so much. But here's what I don't get about that. I understand I understand not playing some guys. But in the faceoff circle, this guy's pretty damn good. And I like how, how he plays. And Dex, I'll start with you on this one. It feels to me like he's the type of guy that that you need to create some some room for. He's not coming up from like the minors. It's not some mm-hmm. fly by night guy. He played in a pretty good professional league, the KHL in Russia, and it feels like watching him play, he can definitely contribute. So I would like to see him even if his line mates don't play as much, I would like to see a way to work him in because I love the fact that the kid looks like he can win a faceoff, which this team has been long star for guys that can, can consistently win faceoffs. 
Yeah, you'd like to use them situationally, right? So, like, if there's a big offensive draw that you need to win for, you know, conversely, in the defensive zone, if you need a big draw that you need to win, you should probably put him out there. I, I kind of understand, to a degree, the slow build and slow burn they're probably having with him. They don't want to throw him out there for 18 minutes a night yet. He's getting his legs adjusted and getting his game adjusted to the NHL level. But there are probably situations where, for a team that has always struggled in the face-off circle the last few years, you probably want to put him in situations where his strengths are, which... For right now, it is face-offs, and there might be more to this this kid's offensive game too, considering where he was drafted and where he played in the KHL. But I would I would assume that going forward, John Hines would probably lean on him as you know, kind of their if do de facto face-off guy. And even if he gets kicked out, do you put Eck back in there? Like, there's 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 a chain of reactions with with missed opportunities with big face-offs. I never have taken a huge stake in the Wild being a bad face-off team because face-offs really just come down to situational than it does a cumulative stat. But I would probably put him, yeah, in, in situations where he should be successful, which are key offensive or defensive zones. What do you think, Jess? Two face-offs. Ooh, that's, yeah. that was that his was reaction when we asked him. Oh, it was brilliant. I mean, he has this confidence. It's not arrogance, it. but he has this confidence to go in there. And you saw his ice time tick up yesterday, obviously. I think yep. John Hines is just in kind of a very precarious situation right now. He needs to win these games. He needs to win all of them. And you're right. I think he's being a little bit cautious with Marat. Not that he's not capable of playing in more situations. As you mentioned, he is on that second power play unit, something that they did do right away in, in his debut. And I think that's the right move because of his skill set at the dot. Um, But I think it's just going to be more or less him continuing to get his legs underneath him as well. I think that's the biggest holdback. As as we'd mentioned before he made his debut, he hadn't skated in quite some time, right? And practice days are so limited now just with the way that the game schedule rolls out, getting them breaks. So I think that's probably something that's going through Heinz's head as well. But you're right, Judd. You need to see him there. Is he going to be the centerman that Minnesota Wild fans so desperately want him to be? We heard the cheers. We heard the excitement around him and so far he's shown um even strengths that I think we didn't know he had going back to his debut four block shots a team high I mean certain areas that he's willing to go in and do he's much more than just a face-off specialist which I think is going to bode really well for the Minnesota Wilds future and the thing that, that um he looks like he has talent he works hard the thing I really like though and, and that he shares with Kaprizov is that both are built like they are mm-hmm. thick guys. They are really thick guys and they both work their asses off. Like like that's the thing about Kirill that's impressed me from day 1. He is a phenomenally talented dude. But there've been guys like Caprisa before Jess who are really talented but take some shifts off or they don't back check, they don't do their jobs. Who's to Dinov and Kaprizov share that and I don't know if it's a Russian thing or what, <laughs> but they share some co- commonality in they might not be playing their best all the time, but you're going to get that work. And I love that. Like as a foundational piece for where this team could be going. I love the fact that those two get out there and work and to your point, block shots, win faceoffs, and both are really, really built type of guys. So they're not going to be bullied off pucks consistently because they're too slight. Yeah, they play a heavy game, Alex Ovechkin. That's what I always loved about him too, yeah. right? I mean, certainly now within his his age, I think he's he's starting to maybe go a little bit slower in, in a lot of aspects, but that was a big thing that always separated Ovechkin from Cros- Crosby for me when you're putting those two against each other as OV's hitting hard into the corners. He's using his size. He's a big boy too, and it's a mm-hmm. Russian thing. I think it's they're over there fighting bears is what I've been told and what I understand, so I would uh, I'd believe that. <laughs> That's probably part of their training regimen. I just hope they're okay. Uh, so, so I did on uh, with I, I did an episode of JHS with AJ on Monday, and I criticized Hines. I thought in the Blues game uh, for basically, I think he benched the fourth line. He basically benched the third line, and it, it's like, dude, if this is how you're going to make the playoffs, it's not sustainable. But I would like to pivot and praise him for last night because this is something that Dean Evason never would have done. The first period, the Wild played okay. Like, it wasn't great. It wasn't awful. It's 0-0. Zero, zero. The Ducks are clearly awful. Like, the Ducks are the ducks are begging you, just push us off the edge and we'll go away, right? John Hines comes out in the second period and he has juggled lines. Felino goes from the third to first line. Kaprizov is not demoted, but he, he's put on the Rossi-Zuccarello line. The third line, Marcus Johansson, thank the Lord, is moved from the second to the third line. 
and they score immediately, and they score two goals quick. That When Dean frustrated me, that was the type of thing that frustrated me is he left those lines together in perpetuity. And, Dex, I thought that, that last night there was no question that that first goal – Within a minute of the of the second period was a product of of shuffling lines, and this is the type of thing that I think a coach can do, and this is where a coach can actually impact a game. Yeah, this is where again, like situational, which we just talked about with Hustadinov, like there are certain situations that call for players to be put in situations where aren't that aren't with their uh, specific line mates. So I think John Hines kind of knows that, and he, and. It's weird. It feels like because obviously the the playoffs are within their grasp and they have to do everything they can, pulling a goalie and trying to forfeit points to just to get two points every single night. It feels like they're playing with their season on the line every single game, right? So I I like the fact that John Hines isn't afraid to basically juggle things up and put players in the right situations, demote guys to a degree if things aren't working. Um, I do think he's pushing right buttons here. I'm curious if that will continue, if that's like a thing he'll always do over his tenure. Is he just doing that right now because the Wild are so close and in and out of these playoff spots, they need all the points. But in general, I mean, I have liked what I've what I've seen from John Hines since he took over for Dean Evason. I would challenge the the thought process there. You know, it's funny, and and you can read all about this in a Minnesota Wild game day program. Pick up yours the next game you're at five dollars. Five dollars hockey. Five dollars sport youth hockey. Five. Uh, yeah, that's true. It's for the kids. <laughs> it's for the kids. Uh, no, but I had asked him, and I asked him specifically as far as roles working and in, in different lines, and he said his approach to in game line changes is never about a demotion or a guy playing poor yes you can argue you're going to double shift your first and second when things are going well but you're right that's because he's doing this whereas dean i think always did use it as this is you playing poorly this is not what i like i mean he was almost so ocd about it a little bit too where he hated he never gave even the rossi zuccarello kaprizov line enough looks right because he just would kind of shake and get tense and be like nope this isn't what it is we need to put hartman back there right? right so i think john hines's approach is just a little bit different like he's changing it but he has the guys kind of put at ease like this doesn't mean i'm you know gonna keep you here we just need to switch something up and you know like you said that first period they needed to get going they started that period out much better and then it just kind of they dragged down to anaheim's level where it was so lackadaisical and so blah so i mean it was definitely a reaction but it is it's something that's a nice change of pace because John Hines isn't afraid to make those moves even in game, but from game to game, right? Again, it's going to be curious to see what he opens up with in LA, knowing that this is another must win situation. So um, yeah. I'm excited to see the line combos there because I think for John Hines, it's never anything set in stone. And I, I think too, uh, to your point about the Kings game tonight, it's a different team as well. Like it's a faster team. It's a better team. <clears throat> like the Ducks, you just need, you literally had to push them. And then the Ducks yeah. are like, okay, we're done. Thank you very much. The Kings are, are you know, in a playoff spot. They're battling. And so y- your point is a valid one, which is, is he going to bring back the same lines that push the Ducks? Is he going to to say, no, 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 I've got, got to put Kaprizov back with uh, with Hartsey and Boldy? Um, the one thing I thought was really intriguing last night, and, and this is a credit probably to Garen, Declan Chisholm, who I think we've all liked. Like, good, good pickup, great, great name. name, fantastic great first name. Great name. Great hair. Um, and he's a guy that I think we all said, oh, okay, yeah. And then we saw him play, and we're like, yeah, this this kid can play. Uh, I thought one of the most interesting things Hines did last night was he promoted Declan Chisholm to the first power play and de- yeah. and, and demoted, and this is a demotion. He took Faber and, and stuck him on the second power play. Um, and it worked. They, they did score a power play goal. I wonder if that one, Jesse, is going to last. Because I will say, among the Wilds' finds, uh, you know, of recent vintage, this might be a really good one. Like, this kid looks like like he can play. And the depth de- defense of this team was definitely lacking in a question mark. And Declan Chisholm brings something for sure with an ability to move the puck. He has made John Merrill look like a hockey player again which is incredible right that's a feat that few of us but it's true it's just i don't i have not been 
as disappointed in John Merrill's play since he's been paired up with Declan Chisholm. So I think that's 100% Declan Chisholm helping get that best out of him. And Declan coming in, the other Declan, not this one. This is so weird. This yeah, is so yeah, weird. Not Declan, not yeah. Declan Goff. And I want to call him Dex, too. Like, so what's up, Dex? How you doing? <laughs> one day, one day. But he, he came oh, in sure. with his, that was touted, was he was a good power play unit. And I'm going to say this very cautiously. I love Brock Favor. I love everything about this season. It is a long, long NHL season, and this is Brock's very first, and I think he's starting to hit that wall. He's a human. It's reality, right? I mean, college hockey is nothing like the NHL, and he's been nothing but a power horse. The minutes that he's played, the situations he's played in, and I think you've seen that. There's been some slippage and very, you know, on Brock-esque play as of late. So I think that might be the other reason is, you know what, let's give Declan Chisholm this opportunity because this is a big reason that Billy went out and got him, not only to add blue line depth, but to get that power play and give Brock a little bit of a break. Let him catch his breath. Again, 21 years old. Um, I think that's that would be a fair trade, and I think Brock Faber would be happy to do that too just so he can kind of reset a little bit and, and make sure he continues to go because there's still quite a few more games left. Mm-hmm. Whether it's by luck or circumstance, uh, Garen has just done a really incredible job at identifying these defensemen either via trade or via, obviously, the waiver wire. They obviously, you know, they bring in Jake Middleton, which also, who is this Jake Middleton guy playing minutes on the Sharks? And I remember sitting next to Judd in his first game, and you said, this this ain't going to work. What is this guy (laughs) doing He screwed up right away. Yep, screwed up right away. I was down on him. He was ready to text Bill saying, you know, you can actually send this guy back to San Jose if you want. Um, And he's turned into a very core defenseman for them. Obviously, getting Brock Faber for Kevin Fiala is, you know, maybe his crown jewel type of trade, where at the time people thought that wasn't enough, and Brock Faber is, might run, a, what, right, run away with the Rookie of the Year award. And then you have Declan Chisholm, who was just a waiver claim because they need bodies, they need capable players, and here he is, what, 10 games into his tenure with the Wild, and he's playing on the top power play unit. So he's done a really good job at identifying those type of players, and that might be his scouting too. That might not just be Bill Garrett, obviously, hand-plucking someone away, think it's probably a trickle down effect but yeah he's he's been incredible and it also just gives them another defenseman I mean the the wilds bread and butter for the last 12 years has been their blue line and they may have found one on the scrap heap that they can keep here for a very long time all right Jesse Pierce three points of a wild card spot the Golden Knights did lose uh to the lightning last night give me your current as as someone who has vacillated mightily on this one (sighs) Give me your current state of the netminders with Gustafson uh, sitting out four consecutive games till last night. Now it is the Ducks. They're bad. He shuts them out and actually did play well. Like he made some nice saves. So you can't discredit that. Flurry almost certain to start against the Kings tonight. Uh, he, he is clearly taken over as the 1A right now. What is the Jesse Pierce state of the wild netminder situation? I think you still have Flurry go in your most important games. I think it was so important not only to get Gus that ice time, and it didn't start out great, right? That first period, he saw like four shots to begin yes. the game. So it was kind of like, oh, he's going to let in a sloppy one because he's just not seen it. But I think it was important to get him that win, get him that shutout because his confidence hopefully will start to regain. I still ride Flurry in the majority of the games. I put him in those situations because I think Flurry can handle that pressure too. I'm starting to question whether Gus will be able to handle those big situation games right now where everything, again, has to be on the line. Minnesota needs to control and get the wins that they can. So coming back Saturday to St. Paul, unless Flurry has just an abominable game tonight in L.A., I think you come back to Flurry, and again, he is your solid one. I won't even go 1A, 1B. I think he's your one right now. And and what's your confidence? Like how can can they? What I think there's uh, 13 games left. Are they making the playoffs? Are you asking well, me to well, put a and statement how's the on this? I'm looking for your confidence ranking on the goaltending with 13 games left, and you're within three points of a playoff spot. Interpret that however you want. The only question is, what's your confidence in the two guys playing goal right now? Because you have a a year ago, you wanted everybody <laughs> gone. At the start of this year, you said, hey, I think it's pretty good. And so with 13 games left, seven against current playoff teams, six against non-playoff teams, what is your overall confidence when you see the guy in pads come out and stand between the pipes? My confidence in Marc-Andre Fleury is very high, hence why I want him to get the bulk of those games. He's playing some dang good hockey right now. He's just Mm -hmm. doing Marc-Andre Fleury things, which is funny because – 
you can see that competitive drive, right? He wants to make the playoffs. He can go on about, oh, it's okay. I don't care about the the record, you know, making it consecutive years. He does, and he wants to be a reason why they make the playoffs. My bigger concern is on the offense and if they can start putting the puck in the net a little bit more consistently, uh, a yes. little bit more frequently. But I think as far as goaltending goes, I'm good with it. It's it's an 80% confidence. It's not the best tandem out there. It's not the best number one goalie out there by any stretch of the imagination. And depending on how long you're losing Jonas Brodeen, that's another question to take into consideration. Sure. But I feel I don't hate it. I'm not like last year. I'm not, you know, just tear it sour. all down. It was just it was sour. bad. It was two years in a row, actually. Remember, that was a that was a tough go-to with that Cam Talbot, Marc-Andre Fleury. Good. Did you say there's 12 games left, right? 13 games 13 left. 13 games left. I, but I, I would have to imagine that Marc-Andre Fleury pending back-to-backs is probably going to start 60 to 70% of these. Mm-hmm. I mean, at this point, they have to. Um, he has been the better goalie, and I know the, the pedigree is there and, and whatnot, but he has to be their number one goalie. Uh, I would be shocked, even if they, obviously, if they they make the playoffs, like that's Marc-Andre Fleury's net for that playoff series. It would take a catastrophic game of, five or six goal game in like back-to-back situation where they would try the gust. This is not for the first time in a long time. It doesn't feel like a rotation. This feels like if, if the playoffs did start today and Mark Andre Fleury continues to play the way he does, yep. that will be his net for the entire series. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Here's the, here's the storyline that intrigues me a lot. So Jess is right. Like he, he's got the pride thing and, and he is a, don't mistake the fact he's a great guy with the fact he is competitive as hell. Like, mm-hmm. he wants to beat your ass badly. Um, but along with the playoff streak, he has a chance to knock out from the playoffs the Vegas Golden Knights, mm-hmm. <laughs> who I don't care what you said, did him dirty. Did him dirty. Did him wrong. And then trade him to the Blackhawks that they knew was an absolute dumpster fire. <laughs> so, like, the storyline there is is a lot of fun. Um so here are your last 13 opponents, starting with tonight. The Kings, then at home, you got the Blues, which is a huge game. The Sharks, the Golden Knights, a huge game. The Senators, the Avalanche, the Jets. Then you go to Chicago, Colorado, Vegas, San Jose, the Kings again. You end the season against Seattle. The interesting thing that I found last night is this. So you've got seven playoff teams left and six non Playoff team. So it's pretty it's pretty fair there, right? The St. Louis Blues have five playoff teams left and eight non-playoff teams. So this comes down to the fact that like those two games against the, the Golden Knights and the and the Blues, the Blues game and the Avs game become absolutely huge. Because if they're if at the end of the day, there there will be two things that would keep this team, in my opinion, from the playoffs. The first thing is the start, but then that stretch with with Hines, where Erickson Eck got hurt and Gus got hurt, and they I think they went one seven and one. But the other thing is their record against the contenders in their division is awful. So like if you can't improve that right now, I think you're done and you should be done. But the only way I think that you jump Vegas, hold off the Blues, um, is if you can against teams like the Golden Knights, but especially the Avalanche, the Jets, um, and and the Blues, if you can now beat those teams. Because I think you've won something like against the top of the Central three or four games all season long. It's really, really really bad, Jesse. 8-11-2 in the Central. There she comes with facts. I didn't have those facts. Just the stats coming at you hot. Um, And you're right, because they got trounced by Dallas each time they met them. You have St. Louis and Winnipeg beating up on them this year. It has not been a good season at all. They're 19-16-2 and against the West in general. Now, as you mentioned, a lot of the teams that they're closing out the year with are Western teams, minus Ottawa, mixed in there. It's a favorable schedule, but so is St. Louis's schedule to end. You need to take the games against Vegas. You need, I mean, again... You need to not only unsurp the teams that are in front of you, but you need them to falter. Nashville is not going anywhere. Nashville is a not even a low key wagon anymore. They are full on wagon right Bruno. now. Go right? Bruno. Bru- Bruno. Go Bruno. We love to see that. Good for you, Bruno. Um, and Winnipeg's still doing their thing too, right? So it's like you need those teams to start to sway, but you need to take both games in Vegas. I was going to allow Minnesota to falter on one of them, but no, you just need to take them. Just take it out. Let's go. Vegas has one game in hand as of right now as well on Minnesota. So that's something to be considered. 
But yeah, it's been a tough year. Even at home, I, I didn't look this record up, so I don't have the numbers. But I feel like at home has not been as successful for Minnesota. And they've got a handful of home games now. So just win. Just probably go undefeated. If they could do that, then they'll just be in the playoffs. Just go undefeated. Just go undefeated. Why beat, not? Beat the good teams, though. Like, seriously, yeah. right, Dex? Yeah, I don't yeah. care. Beat the I mean, good teams. Yeah. I would say so. I mean, yes. It would be nice from a pride standpoint if you can win every game against your divisional or win the majority of them because it would show you can hang tough with them. But 13 games remaining, 26 possible points. I'm going to try my absolute best to do math here. You're on 26 possible points. I would say you safely probably need 18 to 20 points to feel pretty good about making the playoffs and then still, to Jess's point, getting help. Like 18 to 20 points only goes so far if the other team is losing some games too. So that's probably the range they would feel comfortable with. I think anything outside of that, so 16 points or out, they're going to need massive help. They're going to need more help. They're going to have to have some things go their way. I think if you're winning about 70% of these games or at least getting two points in 70% of these games, you feel pretty good about how the math works to make the playoffs. Anything less than that, it's... It's basically a shrug emoji because you don't know what the other teams behind you or above you are doing. I believe in discussion last week with some of the other Minnesota Wild talking heads uh, pregame, 89 points. They've kind of identified 89 points could be the magic number. That's what they think Vegas will probably do if you could get 89 or more. Um, so I think that jives with what you're saying, Dex. I don't yeah, do math. I don't. That that's sounds about 30, right. So they have 76 points. So, you know, yep. in, in theory, um, yep. they would need... 13 more to get there so yes they would they would feel pretty good about that but that's if that's still if like Nashville continues to stay hot or St. Mm-hmm. Louis obviously like does the same thing that's yeah. where I think you probably gotta right. bump that number probably up to like 91 92 mm-hmm. to feel I agree with that really comfortable that you're in the playoff picture and you Fred can't Durant, have teams right? get their three points right like you can't yeah, allow correct. your you overtime have... for Vegas and St. Louis like we mm-hmm. saw last week it's just it's a it's a tough tough draw uh, just to, uh, to go back to your question, the Wild at home, 18, 12, and 4 this season. That's better so than lost I thought. 12 games. Good, not great. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Um, so so the Golden Knights schedule is as follows. And as Jess said, or, or Dex said, a game in hand as well. They've got Seattle and Columbus at home. Then they're at St. Louis, at Nashville, at Winnipeg, at the X. They've got Vancouver at home. And then uh, starting on May 5th, or I'm sorry, on April 5th, at Arizona, at Vancouver, at Edmonton, uh, they play host to the Wild, the Avs, and, but then their last two games are at home against the Blackhawks and Ducks. So if the Wild wants to make hay, they're going to have to, like, you cannot, you cannot be hoping to get in to the playoffs as the Golden Knights, if they have done decently, play host to the Blackhawks and the Ducks, right? So, so like, that's it, because... The, the Wild is going to close at the Kings and then come home off a long road trip and play the Kraken. Uh, I think that they should beat the Kraken, but the Kraken aren't a dumpster fire. So, yeah. like, to me, that's that's the key. But if they don't make this, they are going to look back at their Central Division games and say, you know, if we could have gotten a couple of points here and there, this would not be a battle. Um, so it's going to be interesting. I'm still not sure. As a hockey fan, full disclosure, I think I'd rather see the Golden Knights as a hockey fan. I don't know that the Wild in the playoffs intrigues me as a fan, but if they make it, it it would be it would be a testament to um, some real intestinal fortitude based on the point about they have had a lot of guys hurt and Eric's an Eck out now, yeah, and Brodeen out now against a good Kings team is going to be it's going to make your life very tough. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, Minnesota, I don't think is going to be able to put up a great fight in that first round. And that's going even out, not making fun of how they're always exiting that round. It's just, it's not their year. But I will say, I agree with you, Judd. I'm very proud of the way that they've responded and played as of late. It's been a frustrating season to see the inconsistencies, but they're really going out and doing the damn thing and making it kind of fun to watch right now and see if they will, they won't, they play that game a little bit, which makes me think that they're going to make it. They're going to F around and find out, and then they're going to go ahead and make it, and it might be a four-game sweep, but they're just going to, you know, why not? If you are if you are the one seed, how much are you presently cheering for the Wild? Oh, yeah. Because if I'm the one seed, the Golden Knights are going to get Mark Stone back. Uh, who who's the guy that, that that they obtained from the Sharks? 
Hurdle. Hurdle's going to come Hurdles. back and play. Like, that's the thing. As a fan, I want that team in the playoffs because they could bump off a one seed. Yeah. The Wild almost has no wow. chance. But, my God, if I'm the one seed, I'm like, oh, yeah, bring on the Wild. Yeah, this is great. Uh, last thing uh, that, that comes from the uh, GM meetings in Florida this past week. I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on this, a proposed rule change that still has to go through the Competition Committee and the Board of Governors. So this is not done yet, but it's proposed. The coaches can now challenge a puck over the glass from your own zone, which is a delay of game penalty. If it's unsuccessful, it becomes a five on three. Jesse, start with you. Your thoughts. I do like trying to get th- this call right because it's always seemed very weird that you can't like go back and look because sometimes it's so clear cut just wrong. But the five on three is a intriguing twist. Your thoughts on that? I like that they're doing the five on three. If only it'll make players on the ice rethink things. Coaches really think through things, right? It's not something sometimes that's my problem with challenges. And this goes for not just hockey, it goes for football. Like you can just throw it out there willy nilly. Hey, we're going to see whatever two minutes, but a five on three makes it much, much tougher to just willy nilly it. So I like it. Um, cause I agree. I think you want to get that right. Cause certainly there've been a number of instances, including against the Minnesota wild where it's like, that wasn't what that should have been. Yada, yada. Um, and it could be interesting. Give it a shot. Why not? It is funny that uh, you're challenging delay a game, and if you are wrong, you are penalized for delaying <laughs> for the delaying game. The game. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I, I think to Jess's point, I think it changes the more the sh- if it is indeed improved. I think it changes the entire strategy of how you try to do to get off, get the puck out, and and clear it out and from whatnot. So yeah, I'm I'm for it. Um, you know, I, I would you know if I was doing a rule change, I would just take out. You know, offsides and all these other sorts of rules. I would, I would have a oh, crazy yeah, you'd blow situation. The game up. Well, you I'd blow the entire game up. That's what they should be doing. They tabled this one, which pisses me off because it needs to be fixed. Three on three OT. Ten minutes? No. They need to. You can't go backwards all constantly. backwards, backwards yeah. yes. They, you've three been... on three has gone from this unbelievably fun, like lightning fast. Oh, my God. It's pond hockey. It's the greatest invention, right? Jesse will tell, tell you now, you watch these things, and it's like, who can circle back more? Mm-hmm. Like, teams teams will be in the slot with a puck, and if they don't like their shot, they'll go pass Half it court. back to their own goaltender. Half ice, yeah. I mean. Half ice. Just put the, yeah. put, Over and back. Put, put, the, and back. put the other net even just right. And, Over and back. Yeah. Over and back. And like if that. you get called, yeah. it's not a penalty. That's face too off. strong. It's a face-off face off. in, in, in the look at us. offending team zone. Look at this. We're fixing Which I hockey. thought they did discuss that they were going to re-look at where the face-off then moves. I know in some of these rule changes from the GM's meetings, that was a big point of contention was like, well, you shouldn't have the face-off down in this defensive zone because what's going to prohibit a team from still doing that, right? So I think that is the biggest thing. I think you fix where the face-off goes that might expedite it a little bit more, right? I mean, it would slow the game down at first because because guys would screw up. Yeah. But I th- but I think if you are if you lose the puck and it now goes into an offensive zone face off for the non offending team. Yeah. Because uh, I mean they've got to do something. This is ridiculous now. Yeah. Everyone, I think it was was it the Ducks that started to do that a couple of two or three years ago. The Ducks were one of the first teams to circle back and they take their time. And then of course since it worked it got copied. Um, and the last one, I think that we saw at the X, Jesse, it was just a festival of going, oh, yeah, the Predators game. The Predators now, game. now Flurry got pulled, and so that was awesome. Mm-hmm. But that was very rare, of course. But if you recall before that, the Predators were playing for the shootout. Mm-hmm. So they would just circle back. Yep. Just fix that. And literally were. Like Ryan O'Reilly told me post game in our conversation yeah. that we're really yeah. good in shootouts. So that's what we were trying to get to, which I'm sure there are plenty of teams that are thinking. Of. Or here's this. You add more overtimes. You make it longer or you do more. Yeah, so then longer. you can't, you know, just do something. I so then it's though. not right on yeah. their forefront of their brain. Like, oh, we're going to get a shootout there here quickly. Or just pull the goalie and go win. You but, know? but then you lose your points. Just kidding. So teams aren't going to do that. Oh, no, it was great when, oh, great. my God, when Hines did that. I was like, this is the gr- good for John Hines. Anyway, it's not that hard to fix a sport, guys. Here's here's what's happened. Call us. Here's what Call takes us. place. You put in cool rules. Coaches ruin them because that's that's their goal in life is to try and and screw up the sport. And then we combat them with new rules that piss off the coaches. It's that simple. Jesse, great job. Declan, great job. Judd's 
hockey show. Uh, probably back late this week with AJ to talk about uh, the game against the Kings and to set up the Blues game on Saturday. We will see you all soon.